So thinking about how we apply these modalities to online regulatory issues, you can see immediately that each one of these four forces has important work to do in online regulation. So taking, for example, content regulation. The law has historically prescribed certain forms of content. We have laws against offensive content. Um, over a third of Australians think that there is too much offensive content on the internet. In order to deal with that, we can rely on the law. So that our existing laws include, for example, a common law offence of obscenity. They also include a classification regime where people can bring complaints to the Communications and Media Authority in a, about material that they think is offensive or obscene. Now, that law exists and it can be enforced to some extent, but it's really difficult to enforce those laws when the people who are communicating the speech are outside of the jurisdiction. So it's hard, obviously, to enforce our criminal law, obscenity charges, against people who are not in Australia, just as it's hard to impose our classification regime on speakers who come from another jurisdiction. So these are the limits of our law, and it turns out that our classification regime is not really very effective, even though it technically applies to material that is hosted overseas, it's not effective at all at regulating content that is outside of Australia. So we look at the other modalities of regulation. And some of you may remember the internet filtering debates um, back in 2008, 2009, where the Labor government of Australia at the time sought to introduce a mandatory ISP filter on offensive content. And how exactly this was defined was a, a bit of a thorny issue. But the underlying goal was to find a technical solution to the problem of regulating content and offensive content in particular. So the government took the view that if there were rules that regulated content in broadcast media and in print media and so on, then those same rules should be applicable to the online experience. And the way in which the government sought to enforce those rules was to impose obligation on intermediaries, the internet service providers that provide consumer access to the internet, and require those intermediaries to block access to websites that contained offensive content. It was a censorship regime designed to enforce our existing standards that we apply to broadcast and publications. Uh, sorry, broadcast media and publications. It failed in the end. Uh, it was quite a controversial regime, but it was an example of how the government sought to impose restrictions through technical changes to the code, the architecture of the internet, in order to achieve regulatory goals. There are other options too in content regulation. So for example, we have market-based incentives. We subsidize the cost of uh, family-friendly internet filters that uh, parents can install voluntarily on their own internet connections to help police what their kids and other household members might be uh, accessing online. And we make that cheaper so that it becomes more accessible and more widely used. We also have uh, standards, moral codes about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable to communicate online. So you see, for example, the work that's done around uh, all the huge outrage that comes out uh, in the papers at all levels of government up to the prime minister when someone defaces a Facebook memorial page, for example. This is a clear example of how social norms about acceptable online behavior are created. And there is a strong community expression that says that that sort of behavior, defacing someone's memorial page, is wrongful behavior. And to some extent, imperfectly of course, that is internalized or accepted by a large proportion of the community. Not everyone, but it works, at least to some extent. Importantly, none of these modalities are ever truly independent. They all work together in complex, sometimes conflicting, sometimes reinforcing ways. So, for example, 
with content regulation, we see how markets have emerged to deal with some of these problems. We already talked about filters, um, voluntary filters that are available to purchase, but the social networking sites and the search engines and the other online intermediaries that make content available are also starting to react to the pressure that people are placing on them to make sure that the content on the internet is cleaner, safer, less offensive. So for example, social networking sites like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, uh, all of these have mechanisms, have developed mechanisms to enable people to rate or flag content. And this is a code-based adaptation driven by a market need to enable people to report content that they find offensive. And that creates as a flow on effect, a social norm about what sort of material is acceptable and what is not. There are huge contests about the substance of those norms. So for example, there was a big controversy around Facebook banning um, pictures of mothers breastfeeding but allowing pictures of people who had been beheaded. And uh, there are constant contests about what is acceptable and what is not. But at any rate, you do see that each of these platforms is constantly trying to respond to the demand of its users to some extent to develop a cleaner experience, a more safe more welcoming experience. And that's developing in really, really interesting ways, mostly isolated from a lot of government intervention. Although the government is also there in the background, placing pressure on these sites to act in certain ways as well. Another example is copyright infringement. In the 1990s, when Napsters came onto the scene, the answer of the music industry was to turn to the courts. So the music industry sued and they were eventually successful against Napster uh, on the basis that Napster had contributed to the infringement of its users. So Napster was itself liable for copyright infringement and eventually Napster was shut down. It didn't really stop the file sharing problem though. So the industries had to adopt different strategies. And you see this in a really interesting case study of experimentation over the last 20 years. After suing a range of intermediaries and reaching some dead ends with that, the industry then turned to suing individual users. And again, that didn't work out particularly well. So at some point around 2006, 2008, the industry turned away from enforcing copyright law in the courts and tried to go down other routes. So you remember the advertisements uh, uh, that sought to create a social norm that infringing copyright is morally wrongful. After all, you wouldn't steal a car, would you? So these are attempts by the industry to drive the adoption of new social norms through mass media marketing. That's been somewhat successful. Also, they've received a lot of backlash, but they are getting much more sophisticated at the way in which they feed and generate and support these social norms. The industry also turned towards code. So for example, rather uh, than suing YouTube, well, Viacom sued YouTube, but the other rights holder groups didn't sue YouTube. They preferred to work with Google and YouTube to develop a code-based solution to the copyright infringement problem on YouTube. So now, when you upload a video to YouTube, Google automatically scans that video and checks for any content that might infringe copyright. This is called Content ID. This is new technology developed by Google that really has a huge effect on copyright infringement, at least on the YouTube platform. So when a video is alleged to infringe copyright, the copyright owners are notified and they then have a few choices that they can make either automatically or uh, manually as the case, uh, as the case requires. They might ask that access to the video be removed completely or that the audio track be silenced if it contains infringing audio recordings, so music. Or they might do nothing and choose to let the video go, or they might even choose to monetize, to run ads by that video. This is a hugely important change in the technology 
that delivers or underpins the YouTube system that provides rights holders with new ways to enforce their rights. So by putting pressure on Google to develop new code-based solutions, they have been somewhat successful in achieving those goals. Rights holders have also turned to market-based solutions to tackle copyright infringement. So perhaps a little bit later than some might have liked, but eventually we saw services like iTunes Music Store uh, emerge to deliver consumers with what they wanted from the promise of digital distribution, the ability to buy access to cheap, convenient digital media that appears on your computer with a minimal of fuss. iTunes fills that need for a large proportion of consumers. After iTunes come the uh, streaming models, the all-you-can-eat systems like Netflix and Spotify that really deliver on the promise of abundance that Napster gave consumers and that the industry took nearly 10 years to actually deliver upon. The ability to access the wealth of human recorded creativity and knowledge for a flat monthly fee is a hugely important market-based intervention to change the way in which people access content. 